If you'll turn to Titus chapter 2. Titus 2 has been a good season for us as a body. I am seeing so many amazing things that the Lord's doing in the body, causing the growth of the body, and just want to encourage you um, how beautiful it's been to watch. I just want to keep going until we have a culture of discipleship here at Southside, where everyone is being mentored or mentoring someone else, being counseled, giving counsel, training one another, all the one another's of the New Testament, and it's just the way you think. It's supernatural. It's natural of uh, what you think and how you respond to one another. And so I, I just, in shepherding through this chapter two, I just, I don't want you to hide from the body of Christ. Uh, I don't want you to try to do this alone and on your own. This my walk is my walk and no one else's business. That the gospel is given, it, it overcomes all of our hurts and insecurities of walking in a world that has abused us and, and just hurt us in many different ways. The love of God springing up in my heart won't let me keep the body at arm's length. I won't keep you away from it. And so don't let yourself be, say this. I'll hear this. No one is loving at this church. And that just can't be the case. And, and what I'm going to say in love, it's scary to admit that the problem is you, isn't it? It's tough to just really be honest before God and say there's something broken in me that needs to be healed and grown in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The reason that you don't have intimate relationships is because of you, and it's not the whole church. And so there's a group of you that are just exploding, and then there's some who it, it's hard to be that vulnerable. I, I know it's very vulnerable. But I just don't want you to go your whole life pointing fingers uh, because the gospel didn't do for you what it promises. And I've said this many times from the pulpit, is the gospel is that you are a million times worse than you ever th thought you were or dreamed of. And yet you're a million times more loved than you could have hoped or believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when that gospel gets a hold of your heart, you can now be vulnerable and you can open up and you can admit what you couldn't admit when you were an unbeliever. I, I had to fight that I was righteous. And now for the first time, I'm, I'm broken and I need the body of Christ and I engage it and I look to it to heal me. I'm more broken than I ever thought. But I have found a love that is far more healing than I ever thought I could find. And now I can take the steps in loving other broken sinners unafraid. The gospel draws your heart out to love others, to go beyond fears, hurts, and insecurities. It, it will move you out unafraid. I'm no longer a slave of fear. Amen? And so this is hard. But the gospel can heal and set you free from a lifetime of hurts and rejections. Or a lifetime of shipwrecking all your relationships. Your, your history is you break relationship after relationship after relationship because you're aggressive and maybe you're obnoxious. And you can call it faithful, but it, it isn't. It isn't faithful. And now you can come into a body and you can confess it and you, you can look it right in the face and own it because of the gospel. And now you can let the body of Christ teach you how to live a gracious Christ-like life. And some of you need to be healed of this. And we want to help you. And we want to, we want to journey with you. And we want to forbear with you. We, we just got a bunch of sins. And we're going to make mistakes and hurt each other. But this is the beauty of the body of Christ. And I see you doing it. And this morning, I just felt led of God. I want to help some who just can't come out from that bondage and hurt that you've experienced in your life. And so no matter what I say, you're going to be selfish. And you will never care about your brother or sister more than yourself. If I feel hurt, I will shut down from everyone else. And I, I can't do that. That's not the gospel. You don't care about their true personal struggles. And you certainly don't want help with yours. The gospel has to set us free or Titus 2 will never work. If Titus 1 has not set us free in the doctrine of the gospel of Jesus Christ, if that has not set us free, we are just going to make chaos and sin by dwelling closely together in Titus 2. And I've watched it closely where body life causes people to thrive. They just blossom up. 
but for others it reveals the depth of your insecurity and your bondage to sin and it causes schisms, fractures, strife, life hurts and pains. And that's what the gospel's got to heal. And as a group, together, we heal that with each other. And so I'm sticking this scalpel in your heart this morning to gently cut out cancer that is shipwrecking you from entering into what God has made and designed this church to be so that we will adorn the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's my ultimate motive, is that we'll adorn the gospel of Jesus Christ with all of our differences, all of our hurts, all of our insecurities, and we come under that gospel and we grow each other up into the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to go before God and just pray for all of you in my own heart this morning. Let's go to our God. Father Titus 2, um, it does, it reveals things about our heart that there have been hurts and there's things that cause us to hold back and to pull back and to keep covered. And yet, God, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are free to be sinners because it's been remedied. And what we've looked for in people, we've now found in you. We are, we are in the inner circle. We're in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're in the Trinity. And we are loved and we are accepted and we are your children. God, that's God to heal us. And so I pray, I love this body so much. And for those who have been hurt so badly in this world and in the church, I pray, Lord, for your healing hand, even this morning, that you would cause them to quit pointing fingers and that it would be pointed to their own heart and say, I'm the problem. I'm afraid to really open up and to let my life be vulnerable. And I pray that the gospel would conquer that, Lord, that it would just overwhelm it and wash it away. And that we would be set free to give our lives to one another. That our mindset would no longer be, how can everybody serve me? But God, I come in here to serve this body. I want to build up. I want to love and mentor and help and encourage this body. I pray, Lord, that you would bring healing to the hearts that are holding to things that the gospel can fix. And so let them step out, baby steps in faith, to begin to engage in the body of Christ the way you've designed it. Lord, we pray this. We, we look to you. We don't look lightly upon these hurts, but we look with confidence that you are able to do what we cannot do for ourselves. So I thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Titus 2. So why does this Titus 2 matter so much to me? Why am I moving so slow and just keep harping on all of this? Well, there are a lot of reasons I know that in Ephesians 4, the body causes the growth of the body. That is such a critical piece to the church. But I think in Titus 2, Paul is taking it even deeper than that. By doing Titus 2, we will grow by discipling one another. We will grow up in our faith. We will go deeper, and that is true, and that is very good. Yet Paul is hes so excellent at not leaving something at just face value. He always goes deeper. And the question is, why, Paul? I think he answers the question that I have struggled with for 25 years of ministry. And I've been all over the board on this issue, and it's that that of church evangelism. It's a passion of mine, and I'm always trying to get my arms around how do we do it, what ways. It's been a passion since I was saved in 1987. And I instantly, as I received the gift of grace, I wanted to bring it to my family and friends and people in need, and I just engaged in evangelism right out of the gate. And so as a pastor, it's always been a a burden. How should we evangelize as a church? The the one thing that we're left here in this world to do is for the spread of the gospel and glory and worship and all the things that we do will continue, but evangelism is going to cease on that last day. And so the church is here now to spread the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to others. So how do we go about this? What does the Bible tell us about how to do corporate evangelism and I've tried so many things since we started this church. When we first started, I would say, go through your neighborhoods. We made flyers, hand out flyers for a four-week study. We'll do it in the neighborhood on God, man, Christ, heaven, and hell. And so I started entering into neighborhoods doing that. <coughs> Excuse me. I tried monthly evangelism night. I, I paid for the pizza myself. Just bring all your friends. I'll preach the gospel once a month. I've tried classes of equipping the saints with the gospel. We did... Denver Rescue Mission to get in there, and we did coats and clothes for the homeless with Gospel Community Church, and we started the Church of the Homeless with the college group. 
We do, we do flyers inviting people to Christmas and Easter to hear the gospel. And Brian was ministering in the community with the youth group for Backyard Bible Club, meeting neighbors, and we, we saw families come into the church from that. We've been in nursing homes and prisons, and we've done all of these things, and, and I've seen uh, conversions in all of that. But you know where I, I have seen the most conversions uh, since this church has started? is people who you, who you meet in your everyday life and you just love them, and you care about them, and you share with them, and then I just bring them into this amazing body, and they just, boom, they grow, and they blossom. People who have come into our college group who have been loved by one of the members, and then the rest have reached out and cared about them. Our kids who have been loved uh, on a day by day in the care of this body who have been converted. So isn't that amazing? As you go through the Bible, it's, it's not about schemes and how to bring in the masses. It's not about buying ads on the radio and TV and billboards and spending millions of dollars to spread the gospel on mass levels. It was Jesus pouring into 12, loving and sharing with the people as he came across them in day-to-day life. I just can't find in the Bible this mass marketing approach that we as Americans fall into and love so much concerts and crusades and gatherings and convention centers and million men marches that will spread the gospel quickly. Yet I heard about a large survey of people who became Christians, and it said, how, how are you converted? And 90% of them said, by a personal witness. So what is our biggest obstacle then in our personal witness? If that's the means that God uses What's the obstacle? Well, we have to overcome 2,000 years since Jesus Christ walked this earth of the so-called Christians that have defamed the name of Jesus Christ. Scandals and sins, contradictory lives conforming to this world, all of these things under the name of Jesus Christ have made it so hard in personal evangelism that when you meet someone, they've always got an example, no way, I won't have anything to do with Christianity because of that. Every unbeliever has an example of a hypocrite in their Christian faith. Every time there's a mass murder, it seems like they always claim to be Christians. Why can't they just once say, I'm a Mormon? (laughs) So what do we need? Paul tells us in Titus 2 what we need. All of this marketing and advertising and big events will do nothing if they come into Southside Bible Church and we don't live godly, transformed lives. We have to live lives that will overcome the testimony of those who sin publicly and scandalously. If we are no different, what is the power of our testimony? So we need to grow, and we need to grow each other, learning to draw from the vine itself so that we might bear much fruit. We need Titus 1 so badly in our day and age, a purity of truth. And we need Titus 2 so badly in our day and age, a purity of life. So we need the purity of truth that produces a purity of life. I said that quote before, show me your redeemed redeemed life and I might believe in your redeemer. And so that's what Titus 2 is about. I have a dear friend who shared with me his journey. I think it was six men who destroyed the testimony of the gospel and they were all his pastors. He just wanted an elder who would live out the faith truthfully. What about a whole church? What about a whole church that will do this, that will live this out truthfully and faithfully? What will God do with a whole church like that? Listen to Paul's evangelistic strategy in Titus 2. In verse 5, with the older men or the older women, it says uh, at the end, so that when we live this way, the word of God will not be dishonored. In verse 8, with what we looked at last week with the men, so that the opponent will be put to shame having nothing bad to say about us. And now in the verse we'll look at this morning in verse 10, he says, so that, another henna clause of purpose, that they will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. That is Paul's evangelistic strategy. Here is our evangelism, lives that are growing each other up into the truth of Jesus Christ. Lives that are living like Jesus Christ did while he was on this earth. It is really the most powerful apologetic I know is the life of the Christian church. So please hear this. It may offend some of you, but I've been on a roll. I'm just going to keep at it. 
But to just be a church that all we do is teach doctrine in every setting. At our women's get-together, they'll never be shallow. Of the tightest two things we saw last week, we're only going to teach deep doctrine. Our men's group, we are going to dig in deep, and we're going to learn the Greek and the Hebrew. And you know what happens? I was a part of a church like that. And what happened is we spent all of our time tearing apart everyone else's doctrine, and then we started doing it to each other. And with all the, the knowledge of doctrine, we never produced any Titus II in the younger men or women. And you know what happened? The Word of God was dishonored. And the only conversions we ever had was if we beat our kids with enough doctrine until they said uncle and we stuck them in the waters of baptism. And on the other hand, if you spend all of your time on Titus 2 and you have relationships and you teach each other how to live practically and you become application addicts with no doctrine running through our heads and hearts, you will never get a true Titus 2. Unless we hold tightly to the Word of God, study it, learn it, and grow in it, you can't get to Titus 2. So this is God's beautiful balance. The beautiful picture of people letting the Word of God dwell in them richly. Working together to grow up each other into a day-to-day -day life that displays the gospel of Jesus Christ. The lost are drawn to it like flies on honey. I, does honey draw flies? <laughs> the saying I grew up was like stink, but I like honey. Honey's better. It, you'll, they'll be drawn to it like flies on stink. And godly character is the great need of the day so that we may live lives that put Jesus Christ on display. We all have a part to play in this. And my question this morning is, will you play your part? Or are you going to stay out on the sides and live lives that, that people are going to say, I don't want to believe the gospel because look at how he acts at work. Look at how he treats his wife. Look at his children. Do you want to join in this? All right, that's my introduction. Sometimes you can grow more in an introduction than in the body of a sermon. <laughs> can I get an amen from anyone? I, I didn't think I'd get any. That was good. All right, let's dig in. Titus chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. This is the last section of transformed lives that will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. And this one might not come to mind when you think of evangelism. But what really hit me in observing this text this week is that godly women, you're to, to teach the, the younger women to be godly so the Word of God won't be dishonored. And then the older men teach the younger men so that the opponent will be put to shame having nothing bad to say about us. And then employees uh, live this way so that they will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. And somehow good employees are going to show that God is a saving God. More than godly women and godly men doing their roles, he picks in verse 10 for the boss and employee, you're going to put on the gospel of God. You're going to show that he's a saving God. That just didn't seem to fit for me. You want people to know that your God has sent his son Jesus Christ into this world to save people from their sins. They will see it in the way that you work. Most people tell me, I want to get out of the workforce so I can go into full-time ministry. And Paul's saying, you're in full-time ministry. You are a missionary. You are an evangelist right in your place of work. If I want to adorn the doctrine of God who saves, it will be seen in how I work. That's a powerful thing that God is saying here in Titus 2. So how is that? How is me being a good employee, working hard as unto the Lord with a good attitude, how is that going to put God as a saving God on display? I don't think anything shows more of a transformed life than how you approach and look at the day-to-day -day calling of your work. Nothing will stand out more than this. This will show the world, wow, his God is a saving God. Anyone say that at work lately? You can't find joy in this factory or in this school or in this business. This is where we complain the most. Most complaining goes on uh, about the weather and about your job. That is where most sin takes place on the boss's dime uh, is, is there. 
And so you want an evangelism program? It's a lot easier to give out tracts and serve a meal, which I'm not against in any way, but then going to work and working like no other because you're working for the one who is like no other, the Lord Jesus Christ. That is a powerful evangelism tool. How many times have you heard this? How, how are you doing? My job stinks. The boss does this. They don't appreciate me the way they should. They don't pay me the way they should. Uh, they, pronounce, they promoted a ninny ahead of me, and it goes on and on. And the question is, what should we be like? And I just want you to look with me this morning in Titus chapter 2, verse 9. Urge bond slaves to be subject to their own masters in everything, to be well-pleasing and not argumentative, not pilfering but showing all good faith so that they will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. This word for urge, and it's a very strong exhortation. This is not mild. I am urging, I am giving you the strongest of exhortations. Bond slaves, be subject to your own masters and everything. The Greek word is douloi, where we hear the word doulos, which was that, that slave. It meant to be under bondage. But slavery in Paul's day was very different than what we knew in the dark days of America. In Paul's day, some uh, slaves were abused for sure, even like employees are today. But some were very loved. A doulos, remember that? He could put an all in his ear when his freedom came. And if he said, I love my master, I want to stay, he'd have that in his ear so everyone knew he had his freedom, but he chose to stay with his master because he loves him. And some then were given freedom, and some were given houses, even on the property, to marry and raise a family. So the closest thing to a slave in that day would be an employee in our day. Paul tells us an employee the attitude that he must have then. This is dealing with a worker. This is the dignity of work that Paul is establishing. The responsibility of an employee to show that your life has seen the transforming power of God is the, by the way you work. This is it. I want to read just a few verses to show you an analogy of Scripture this morning. Just listen to them. This is Colossians 3.22. Slaves, in all things, obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. Listen to Ephesians 6, 5 through 9. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service, not just when your boss is looking but as men pleasers, but as slaves do losses of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will render service as to the Lord and not to men knowing that whatever good thing each one does, he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And masters do the same things to them and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven and there's no partiality with him. And we'll look at 1 Timothy 6, verse 1. Let all who are under the yoke as slaves regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and our doctrine may not be spoken against. He ties it in there again. And let those who have believers as their masters not be disrespectful to them because they are brethren, but let them serve them all the more because those who partake of the benefit are believers and beloved. Teach and preach these principles, Timothy. And so what I'd like to do with our time then is I want to look at the instruction that Paul gives Titus concerning employees in verse 9. And really for an outline, he gives five things then that should characterize our work in order to put the gospel of a saving God on display. If you want to do that, if with your life you want to put that on display, here are the five things that Paul is saying should characterize your work. So look with me in verse 9. Urge them, bond slaves, to be subject to their masters in everything, to be well-pleasing. So the first one I want to look at is submission. 
submission. A lot of men really enjoy that passage about their wives. I, I just I love when pastor teaches that the wife is to be submissive to the husband. It feels good. But how many men like now, you're, this is your word, you are being called to be submissive. Uh, you're being submissive. It's hupotasso, the exact same word, that military term that means to rank under, to come under someone and to rank under them. And so you are to come under your boss. You're to be submissive to the one who has put over you in authority at your job. You are to be submissive. And so our bosses or our masters have absolute authority in that place. They call the shots and we submit unless they ask us to sin against our God. And so this trend that we see today where everyone is, they want their strikes and their rights and all these different things, it's just flat out against God. I had a guy who works for a large corporation and he said the hardest thing with hiring college kids today is they come in and they tell you what they want and they demand it. When I looked for a job, you came in and you begged for it. You know, now it's, they come in, here's what I want, here's what you're going to pay, here's all the benefits. He said, they come in ready to tell you how to run and what they're going to do. What a difference the spirit and attitude would make to those around you. I remember I worked for my dad when I was in college, and uh, his, his boss's name was Justin Rosen. And every time he came in, just anything he said, my dad said, whatever you say, boss. And it just as a young man, it just, I just watched every time, whatever you say, boss whatever you say, boss. And there was just a, such a submission to his boss. One key is you're to do this even if he or she is difficult or perverse. Submission is an attitude of the heart, and the reason we've said it was beautiful for a wife to be submissive is because it was unto Christ, and that was the beauty, and that's what gives value to a submissive wife. And what gives value to submission and work is it's not your boss is worthy, it's that Christ is worthy. So I show Christ the way I love him and value him by the way I submit and work hard for my employer. This will bring evangelistic impact. I've had people say, I'm bad at evangelism. My words, I just get all tied up. Uh, one preacher said, live the way that God asks. It will manifest a transformed life that will point back to the transformer. And so, okay, if I struggle with my words, how about with your behavior and your submission at work? There's the gospel. Go live it. Secondly, to be these kind of employees, we, we want to be in verse 9, he says, well-pleasing. Well-pleasing. Every time Paul used this word, he, he used it the most. It was always well-pleasing to God. What kind of work would you do if Jesus was your boss? That's a powerful question. As I'm working under Christ. He is my boss. So your task at work as you go in there is to be well-pleasing then to the Lord. For it is to Him whom you are serving. Make that connection and you can get up on Monday mornings full of joy with spring in your step. I get to go serve Jesus Christ today at my job. I work for Christ. I don't grumble and mumble. I work for Jesus Christ. That's my value. That's my worship. That's my evangelism. I go into work with that attitude. Could you imagine if someone asked you, why do you work so hard and heartily? I pray you get that asked. Well, because I'm serving King Jesus. I've been at 30 years at the company, and it's only seemed like a day because of my love for him. Like Rachel and Jacob, when he served all those years, it seemed like a day for him because he loved Rachel so much. Well, I love Jesus Christ so much, it seems like a, a day that I get to go and serve the King of Kings at my job. That will change everything of how you look and how people perceive you on your job. You're to be well-pleasing to Christ. Thirdly, employee, you're to not be argumentative. You don't mouth off. You don't give him a piece of your mind. You don't argue with him. You don't oppose him. You don't talk back and resist him. Have any of you uh, employers ever had an employee like that? Wouldn't you love employees like that? Don't be characterized as a know-it-all. Always telling your boss how he should be doing it and where he's wrong. Don't be that guy or gal. Can I ever challenge or talk to my boss? Yeah, if the boss has made a proper dialogue structure, then use it. But don't be rebellious and always questioning authority. Just have a respect for your authority. When authority speaks, you do it unless it's sin. 
because you're doing it unto Jesus Christ. This will change your evangelism on your job, I'll guarantee it. Fourthly, don't pilfer. Don't you like that word? Pilfer. It means to steal. Uh, It means to embezzle. My first job when I was in college doing accounting, there was a super nice guy named Dave. Uh, Dave was so nice to the boss and submissive, and everybody loved him. He was the nicest guy in the office. And it turned out he pilfered close to $100,000 while he was smiling to the boss. Don't pilfer. We don't, you don't take supplies, you don't, your meal reimbursements, your mileage. You, you can steal by being on the clock and not working, young men. You can steal by being on the clock and figuring all the ways how I can do it without working. I mean, in that day, slaves ran companies, bosses rarely handled the money. And so if you are pilfering, no matter what you say about Jesus Christ, it is out the door. And it's out the door for almost every Christian who will ever come down their path again because they'll say, I remember Jim, he used to steal from the company. He used to just cheat the boss. He would never work. He was always lazy. And they will use you as their excuse for the rest of their lives against the gospel. Don't be those who pilfer. And fifthly, show all good faith. Showing all good faith. The Greek word is, is faithfulness. We, we saw it with the, with the elder. He's to be faithful. Faithful. And it means loyalty. There, there's a loyalty. A loyalty to, the, to a company used to be a really big deal. Loyalty to a spouse used to be a really big deal. In the Old Testament, I forget which book it was, but it, he, he said, God says, I can't find loyalty in the land. As I look out on Israel, I can't find anyone who's loyal. Is there anyone who's loyal in the land? And this is what we want then to give to our employer. I want to be one of loyalty, faithfulness. I am someone you can trust, someone you can count on. You know I've got your back. I'm not always looking for the guy who will give me more at the next job and trying to cheat you and always running around. I am faithful. And that's the way my boss looks at me is this guy's faithful. I can trust him. He's loyal. He's loyal to the company. What a, what a testimony that is in a day and age where no one cares about anything anymore. Loyalty means nothing to countries, to families, to churches. There's just no loyalty in the land. This will stand out. This will put our God, our saving God, on display. Our society is in big trouble, and men will proceed from worse to worse. And what happens in the workforce is so broken today and off. It's where depravity is manifested in really some of the deepest ways. And what a difference an employee like this will make. In fact, Paul says it'll do this. It will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect, if you'll be that kind of employee. We will make our saving God attractive to those around us. The Greek word for adorn, it's a beautiful word, cosmeo. What English word do you think we get from that? Ladies, just throw it out there. Dude, took me a week to figure that out. So the Greek word cosmeo is cosmetics, which what does that do? Well, it it takes disorder and it makes it orderly. And so we're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're to do this with the gospel of a saving God which is what this Bible reveals from cover to cover, is the way we live and and act at work will make the gospel beautiful to those who are watching. It it, it becomes beautiful. And, And some of you need a little makeup at work. Christian employees, what would happen if we lived this way at work? What would happen if godly men would train the younger men to be godly? And if the godly women would engage and train the younger women to be godly women, it would be beautiful. And the world would say, your God is a saving God. For you're different and there's no one like you. That's what's killing our evangelism. It's not knocking on more doors or being on the radio with commercials or ads on billboards. But when the unbeliever comes into our midst, they will say, surely God is in this place. And I've been hearing more and more of that lately. And I just, I want more of it. I just, it's beautiful. They're they're just, they're seeing it. There's something beautiful going on in your midst. 
And when they see us at work or in the world, they will say, you have a saving God. Tell me about your God. And so, brethren, I pray that God's grace may abound and make us into people like what we're seeing in Titus 2. For his name and his name alone, that would be our our one motive, is that God would be glorified by these things happening in our midst and being built up into the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I pray as I began this sermon, if if you're one of the ones who are just struggling to to come out from that hurt, that danger, all the, the past, and you just... You want to be discipled and mentored and just encouraged slowly in it. Uh, We want to do that with you. The gospel's worthy. It's worth taking the steps and coming out and and engaging in the body. So we we are here to help and love and nurture you uh, in that that process. And I just say the the main reason we want this then is for the glory of God. We We want to put that name on display, the name that is above every name, and that people would look and worship our God because they see his power transforming and changing our lives. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you for Titus uh, chapter 2 and what we've been learning in it. And so, God, we, we've loved Titus chapter 1, and we've labored in doctrine for 18 years, and we will continue until you come to teach and prescribe these things to uh, exegete and, and bring forth the Word of God and its teaching. Lord, we know that is what we need. We don't need the world's thoughts. Uh, we need your thoughts. And so we are devoted to that. And I pray that as we grow in these truths, Lord, that now we will use them for each other, that we won't sit and hide and just take them for ourselves and think that that's the end goal. God, the end goal is your glory. And the way you get glory is by lives being changed and transformed by being in relationship, by growing in truth and pouring into one another until we put on display the glory of God and the face of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, I pray that we would be devoted to these things. I urge us to be devoted to these things. And I pray that you will use us in a mighty way and that unbelievers, if there's any unbelievers here, that they would look And they would see the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ by the way we love you and the way we love one another and the way we live our lives. God, if there are any here, they don't need to work harder at their jobs to be saved. For there's one who's already done all the work and on a cross he said it is finished and he died in our place so that we could have reconciliation with God. I pray, God, open eyes to look and see the beauty of our sweet Savior even here this morning. God, I thank you for the word of God, and it's in your precious name that we do pray. Amen.